Welcome to module five of the term, where we'll be looking at chapter six, entitled Matters of Sex. Now, before we look at the topics of chapter six, I wanna go back to look at where we've been, just to keep track of how these materials are progressing. In chapter four, we looked at single gene disorders. We spent time considering simple inheritance patterns, autosomal dominant patterns of inheritance, autosomal recessive patterns of inheritance. And then in chapter five, we moved on to discuss exceptions to these rules of inheritance, things that went beyond the scope of Mendel's laws. There were nine exceptions, including lethal alleles, how multiple alleles involved in a disorder may give rise to different symptoms, dominance relationships, including co-dominance and incomplete dominance, epistasis, penetrance, pleiotropy, that was how single genes have multiple phenotypic effects, genetic heterogeneity, how mutations in different genes may result in the expression of one similar phenotype, and phenocopies, how non-genetic disorders mimic their genetic counterparts to inherited diseases. We also looked at mitochondrial genes and showed how inheriting the mitochondria from the mother and not from the father may lend to variations in Mendel's inheritance patterns in contrast to those single gene inheritance patterns. Now, with this chapter, we're going to consider more ways by which Mendel's traditional patterns of inheritance are skewed. We're going to consider sex-linked inheritance patterns. And in doing so, we'll consider the undifferentiated reproductive system, and we'll see how the reproductive system differentiates to become male or female early in fetal development. We'll consider chromosome structure. We'll look at sex chromosomes. And then we're going to learn more about sex determination before we go on to look at the X and Y chromosomes in detail. Finally, we'll consider the similarities and differences between sex-limited inheritance patterns and sex-influenced inheritance patterns, the process of X inactivation, and finally, we'll look at genomic imprinting. If you're not comfortable with Punnett squares for simple calculations, you need to get very comfortable with those. Go back to chapter four to study those because as we hit this chapter now with chapter six, our Punnett squares and our calculations and our understanding are going to be a lot more complicated for you. So I encourage you to revisit chapter four and the materials I've assigned for chapter four if you had struggles with chapter four. As we consider sexual development, we're going to look at the undifferentiated gonadal system. Six weeks elapse in humans after fertilization before the first signs of sex differentiation are noticed. All humans possessed an undifferentiated gonadal system before this time, including both male and female reproductive ducts. Then, about six weeks after fertilization, a series of events unfold whereby the sexually indifferent gonads and genitalia progressively acquire male or female characteristics. A gene on the Y chromosome becomes active. I'll talk about this gene in a few minutes. It's called the SRY gene. This gene causes neutral gonads to develop into testes, which begin to secrete two hormones, testosterone, as well as mullerian inhibiting substance. Testosterone induces the development of male characteristics, and the mullerian inhibiting substance causes the degeneration of the female reproductive ducts. In the absence of this male determining gene, this SRY gene, our neutral gonads become ovaries and female features develop. So here we have our undifferentiated stage where we're going to see duct work for both male and females. The Mullerian ducts give rise to female structures, our Wolfian ducts give rise to the male duct system, and here we see the SRY gene present. We're going to develop into our male reproductive system with the SRY gene absent, that gene product not being made, we end up seeing the female reproductive system develop. Before we move into the chapter too far, I want to introduce the chromosome structure to you. Up through this point, we've discussed chromosomes very generally, but now we're going to look at chromosomes, including our sex chromosomes, in a bit more detail. So here we have our sex chromosomes. First, we notice that the X chromosome here is considerably larger than the Y chromosome. And in fact, the X chromosome holds about 1,500 genes, of which about 230 of those are protein encoding. In contrast, the Y chromosome holds many fewer genes, somewhere on the order of 600, of which 22 of those are male-specific genes. Next, here and here, we see chromosomes in their duplicated form. We have sister chromatids here. This information here is identical to this information. So this is a sister chromatid, and we have sister chromatids here 
as a duplicate of what's here. And these are connected, these two sister chromatids are connected by these centromeres. The centromere divides the chromosome into two sections or arms, and we'll see that as well. So we have an arm here as well as an arm here. In fact, we have what we call a short arm and a long arm. By convention, the shorter arm is called P, the P arm for petite, and the longer arm is called Q. The arms are equal length when the centromere is in the middle. We see that here, and that's called metacentric. So these are just some generic examples to give you these terms of what chromosomes are named based on where their centromere is located. So when a, a centromere is found between, we will see that called a metacentric chromosome. We have sub-metacentric chromosomes where the two chromosome arms are of unequal length. So we see short arms up here, longer arms here. So this is the P arm, this is the longer Q arm. A chromosome in which the centromere is very close to the end, we see here, and we call this acrocentric. We usually say that the P or the short arm is too short to observe, but it is still present. And then finally here, we have the telocentric chromosome, and these are ones where the centromere is positioned at the very terminal end of the chromatid. There is no P arm whatsoever. Other information to consider here. In this box, we're going to see these little red sections at the top of the short arms and at the bottoms of the long arms. These are called pseudo-autosomal regions, and we have a pseudo-autosomal region one, pseudo-autosomal region two. We'll see one and two as well, and I'll talk more about those in a few slides from now. Lastly, but not labeled on this image, the very tips of the chromosomes have what we call telomeres. A telomere is a short region of DNA at the end of a chromosome and consists of the same short DNA sequence repeated over and over and over again in the form of TTAGGG. The telomere's main function is to help promote and maintain chromosomal stability as well as prevent chromosomal degradation. Specifically, telomeres protect the ends of each chromosome each time the cell divides. Unfortunately, those telomeres get shorter and shorter, just slightly, with each cell division, and there are some ramifications to that in life. As we consider sex determination, humans have what we call the XXXY sex determination, and that's where males are primarily determined by the presence of a particular gene on the Y chromosome. And we have two terms here, heterogametic and homogametic. Heterogametic, the Y chromosome is unique among chromosomes. The presence of the SRY gene ultimately helps determine sex of an offspring. And in humans, it's present in a single copy of healthy individuals. So we're going to look at the Y chromosome in a bit more detail. The sequence of most of the Y chromosome, the human Y chromosome, was determined as part of the Human Genome Project, which went through the late 90s into the very early 2000s, and it revealed that much of the Y chromosome actually consists of short DNA sequences repeated many times by which very few genes are inserted in between. But let's go ahead and look at the various components of our Y chromosome. So first we have palindromes. These are DNA segments on the Y chromosome by which nucleotide sequences are read similarly forward and backward, and they're actually a destabilizing factor in the Y chromosome. With DNA replication, they destabilize that process. They lend to deletions in the Y chromosome when the Y chromosome is being duplicated, and that can result in male infertility. And so what do we mean by palindromes? When we look at a palindrome, we're saying something forward and saying something backward. In this case, we see G-A-A-T-T-C, G-A-A-T-T-C. So that's what we mean by a palindrome. Although the X and Y chromosomes aren't homologous, they're not generally homologous as are 22 autosomes are, they can actually pair together because these chromosomes are homologous in a very small region. And I mentioned this earlier, we call this the pseudo-autosomal region here at the tip and down here at the tip. So PAR1 and PAR2 simply means pseudo-autosomal region 1 up at the top, our short arm at the tip of our short arm, and PAR, pseudo-autosomal region 2 found at the end of the long arm. These are found, again, the two tips, they carry the same genes as what we find in our X chromosome at those PAR locations. In humans, the X and Y chromosomes carry about 60 genes in these pseudo-autosomal regions, encoding for very shared functions between X and Y, bone growth, cell division, immunity. And just to clarify, these regions are shared between X and Y chromosomes, thus allowing for this crossing over these activities just at 
these tips here and here. We have a male specific region, most of the link of the Y chromosome lying between the two PAR regions, those um, pseudoautosomal regions. There are some genes that are found essential for fertility for males, including one very specific gene called the sex determining gene or SRY. The SRY gene, which is abbreviated for sex determining region of the Y chromosome, encodes for a protein called a transcription factor. We're going to see transcription factors in a little more detail in an upcoming unit when we study gene or DNA replication gene expression. But this is going to aid in the control of expression of other genes. SRY is thought to stimulate male development by sending signals to the developing gonads of course, again, with, with having this Y chromosome and the SRY gene, those proteins, those transcription factors, as they're sent out, as we have that developing gonadal system, it destroys potential female structures while stimulating the development of the male structures. Studying patients with unusual sexual development helped early scientists understand sex determination. Specifically, scientists in the 40s and into the 50s identified abnormalities, specifically Klinefelter syndrome and Turner syndrome. Those were the first two syndromes that had to do with unusual numbers of our sex chromosomes. Individuals with Klinefelter syndrome are generally tall with long legs. They are XXY, so they have an extra X chromosome. They have genitalia and internal ducts identifying them as male because they have that Y chromosome, but their testes are small. More than 50% of patients with Klinefelter have infertility. At the same time, feminine sexual development is not entirely suppressed. We have two X chromosomes there. And patients often have slight enlargement of the breasts and rounding of the hips. They most often show no cognitive reduction of facilities and are unaware of having a disorder until treated for infertility. Patients have this sex chromosome count of XXY with the extra X chromosome in the male plus the traditional 44 autosomes. So we end up having a total of 47 chromosomes instead of 46 if we were XY. Around the same time, scientists discovered Turner syndrome. In this syndrome, affected individuals have female external genitalia and internal duct work, and very small ovaries. They're commonly short in stature, typically under five feet. They have underdeveloped breasts, and most often, they have normal intelligence. Patients are missing their second sex chromosome. So we have one X instead of two, we have a chromosome count of 45. Ultimately, the karyotypes and their corresponding sexual phenotypes led scientists to conclude that the Y chromosome determines maleness in humans with the absence of the Y chromosome determining female nature, even if only a single X chromosome is present. It's important for us to note here, scientists cannot conclude anything regarding sex determination under circumstances where the Y chromosome is present without an X chromosome because Y containing human embryos lacking an X chromosome don't actually survive. There are a couple of other uh, things here to consider when we have three X's, four X's, five X's. In contrast, we have two Y chromosomes. So as scientists looked at these and discovered these and then continued to identify patients with additional sex chromosomes or reduced number of sex chromosomes. Taking into account the various symptoms of patients with the incorrect number of sex chromosomes, either an excess or too few, the phenotypes associated with sex chromosome abnormalities or anomalies allowed scientists to make several inferences about the role of sex chromosomes in human sex determination. First of all, the sex chromosomes, or X, I should say, or X chromosome, contains genetic information essential for both sexes. At least one copy of an X chromosome is required for human development. As I mentioned in the last slide, we don't have the ability to study what happens without an X chromosome because we don't see survival. Secondly, the male determining gene is located on the Y chromosome. A single copy of this chromosome, even in the presence of several X chromosomes, usually produces a male phenotype. Third, the absence of the Y chromosome usually results in a female phenotype. Fourth, genes affecting fertility are located on the X and Y chromosomes, a female usually needs at least two copies of the X chromosome to be fertile. And lastly, additional copies of the X chromosome may upset normal development in both males and females, producing physical problems, intellectual disabilities that increase as the number of X chromosomes increases. The presence of sex chromosomes provides a potential mechanism for producing equal proportions of male 
to female offspring, where half of the gametes of a heterogametic sex receive one type of chromosome. For instance, they receive the X-bearing sperm, and the other, the Y-bearing sperm. Provided both types of gametes are equally successful in fertilization, both X and Y being equally successful when they unite with the female X contribution, we should see a one-to-one -one ratio of male to female offspring. In fact, we call the actual proportion of male to female offspring the sex ratio. Our textbook breaks this ratio down into different periods of the human lifespan. We have first of all primary sex ratio. The first sex ratio is called primary because we're looking at the proportion of males to females conceived in a population. This ratio is pretty difficult to garner because it requires tallying embryonic and fetal mortality. Our secondary sex ratio, this is going to reflect the proportion of each sex that is born. And this number is certainly a lot easier to calculate as we don't need to factor in embryonic or fetal mortality uh, to trace this ratio. And then we have tertiary sex ratio. This is the sex ratio at adulthood, and it reflects the ratio of males to females with age, which varies greatly, uh, as you could imagine, over time. It's a result of illnesses, environmental factors, as well as when society intentionally alters the sex ratio. Think of China's one-child policy. Think of war and the tendency to send more men to war. Think of what happened during uh, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, other wars that have happened over time, and how that changes the adult or that tertiary sex ratio. We'll now look at genes associated with our X chromosome. Genes present on the X chromosome exhibit a unique pattern of inheritance in contrast to our autosomal genes we've looked at up to date. In this lecture, we're going to consider two modes of inheritance, X-linked recessive inheritance patterns and X-linked dominant inheritance patterns. And we'll start with X-linked recessive modes of inheritance. X-linked recessive traits are expressed in females if the mutant allele in question is present in two copies, meaning the mother of the offspring and the father of this female offspring each have to contribute a mutant or affected allele to their female offspring. In contrast, when looking at male offspring, an X linked recessive trait can be passed from an unaffected heterozygous mother to an affected son. Recall, this is because males only have one X chromosome. Generally, in X-linked recessive traits, the trait is always expressed in the male with the trait commonly inherited from a heterozygous carrier mother. X-linked traits are easily identified on a pedigree because of their crisscrossing pattern of inheritance. X-linked disorders are passed, in this case, from a homozygous mother to all sons. She has two mutant alleles in terms of those two X chromosomes, and she will give a mutant allele to all of her sons because she has only mutant alleles. One example of an X-linked recessive disorder is a particular form of colorblindness. In this pedigree, if we use this pedigree for colorblindness, the mother, Roman numeral one, number two here, has two mutant alleles for the given gene in question and passes the trait to all of her sons. See here, two, two, and two, four, but to none of her daughters, so two, one, two, three, and two, five. In fact, her daughters will be carriers. If the male offspring in generation two here marry normal, non-carrier females, such as seen here, the colorblind sons will produce normal males and normal female offspring. So we're going to see three, one, two, and three. However, normal visioned carrier daughters, and we'll see a carrier here, who marry normal individual males, such as this situation here, will produce normal visioned females, so we see 3, 4, 3, 6, and 3, 7, as well as potentially normal visioned males, which we see here in 3, 5, as well as colorblind male offspring here in 3, 8. The general facts regarding X-linked recessive inheritance are these. First of all, number one, the trait is more common in males than in females. Two, if a mother has the trait, it means she has two mutant alleles and all of her sons will inherit a mutant allele and have the trait. Three, there is no male to male transmission. Four, for human females, because of having two X chromosomes, X linked recessive inheritance 
has the same inheritance pattern as autosomal recessive disorders. Let me say that again. For human females and for human females only, because they have two X chromosomes, we can treat in this particular situation, we would treat those kind of similar to autosomal chromosomes. X-linked recessive inheritance has the same inheritance pattern as autosomal recessive disorders. Next, a son of a female carrier has a 50% chance of having the trait. And so we saw that here and here. Lastly, mothers of affected male offspring are either heterozygote carriers or homozygous for the mutant allele and express the trait. So mothers of affected male offspring. So here we have an affected male offspring. We see that the mother is a heterozygote here. Here, we have a male offspring that's affected. And if we go back and look at the parental generation, we see the mother in this situation having that homozygous mutant allele scenario. Some X-linked recessive conditions include this example of colorblindness as well as hemophilia B, sometimes referred to as factor IX deficiency. And we'll look at these in our homework and our study guide for this module. What I'd like to do is go ahead and show you how to look at each of these individuals in this pedigree and determine whether or not they are a carrier or what the probability is that they're a carrier. And what I'd like to do in doing so is look at some Punnett squares. So again, we are looking at our X-linked recessive traits right now. And how you need to consider these is we need to be looking at individuals XX crossed by XY. And that's really not going to tell us very much. But when we add one additional detail before we put things into a Punnett square, let's take this individual here. This is a female who has the disorder. And so she would have two mutant alleles and we can let C equal normal vision, let lowercase c equal color blind. And so if we have this individual here, she, we can just add this little c up here. We put a superscript. If we have a normal healthy male, we know he's normal because he only has one X chromosome. If he had one X chromosome that was this particular allele, we would know that he would have the disorder. So he is normal, so we'll just put a capital C. Now what we do is we're going to put in our Punnett square information. And so if this is our female, I tend to put the female at the top and our male across the side. What we're going to see, we just do our normal calculations and x c x c and then we're going to look here and here we're going to go x c y and x c y and so what do we find we're going to find that there are two females and both are carriers they are x big c x little c and so because this is X-linked recessive, we would need two of these small Cs in order for a female to have a disorder. Now looking here at our males, we have two males and both have the disorder. We see X small C Y and another X small C Y. So this is how we look at our X-linked recessive disorders. Let's go ahead now, let's look at this scenario right here. So we know that this X little c, X little c mother is going to give an X little c to the daughter. And here we have an X big C Y, and we're going to see the X big C given from the father. So we know that this individual here, 2, 5, is a heterozygote, and we know that this is a healthy male. So let's go ahead and do this cross. So we're going to have a carrier X big C, X little c, crossed by, we will have an X big C, Y. So we do the same thing. We're going to X big C, X little c, and X big C, Y. And so X big C, big C, X, 
big C, X little C. We will see X big C, Y and X small C, Y. Now, what do we have here? We are going to have one female that's normal with X big C, X big C. So that's this individual right here. We are going to have one female who is a carrier, X big C, X little c. We will have one normal male, X big C, Y, and we will have one affected male who is X little c, Y. So this is what we would get here when we have a big C, little c, and then a healthy male. How do you feel about this? I'm hoping you feel a little bit better. Uh, go ahead and give that some consideration. Reach out to me if you have questions about this and let's move on to our next topic. Next, let's look at X-linked dominant disorders or modes of inheritance. X-linked dominant traits may be expressed in females given just one mutant allele is inherited, meaning the mother may contribute the mutant allele to her female offspring or an affected father may transmit his mutant allele to his female offspring. As it pertains to affected male offspring, an X-linked dominant trait can only be passed from mother to son. Specifically, an affected heterozygous mother, potentially homozygous, can pass the mutant allele on to her son and her son will have the disorder. Generally, in traits inherited in this X-linked dominant manner, there are some given patterns of inheritance. So let's look at these now. First of all, males and females are equally likely to have the trait because we only need one mutant allele. Secondly, there is no male-to-male -male transmission because the mutant allele is on the X chromosome, not the Y chromosome, and fathers give a Y chromosome to their male offspring. Traits don't skip generations. If the trait is displayed in offspring, that means at least one parent must also show the trait. If parents don't have the trait, their child won't have the trait. So that's a, I think those two really connect together. Males who inherit the mutant allele are usually more severely affected because there is no other allele to mask its effect, as one would see in the case with a female with one mutated allele and one normal allele, making some kind of a gene product that might assist with that. Also, homozygotes for the dominant condition have a more severe form of the condition. And so that applies to females that have two mutated alleles. So that applies to females who have two mutant alleles. There are very few X-linked dominant conditions. Our textbook refers to Rett syndrome, which impacts brain development, as well as incontinentia pigmenti, which affects skin, hair, teeth, some nails, and the central nervous system. We tend to see that only in females because in males, it's often lethal before birth. We'll take a look at some ways by which we look at inheritance patterns for our X-linked dominant inheritance mode in our homework, as well as our study guide, but let's go ahead and go to our tablet and calculate some of these things out by looking at Punnett squares. Looking at our X-linked dominant mode of inheritance, and we want to go ahead and consider chromosomes. So if we look at this mating here, we have XX crossed by XY. And in this case, we're going to assume some kind of given disorder, Rett syndrome. We're going to let R equal healthy, let lowercase r equal Rett syndrome. And so again, what we need to do is we need to place these r's here. And typically when we have this X-linked dominant manner of inheritance, we tend to see that our individuals who are affected are just heterozygotes, okay? We have normal allele, mutated allele, and then our male, we have a healthy male here, he's healthy. So we would give him that uppercase letter as well. Let's go ahead and look at our Punnett square. We would put X big R, X little r, X big R, Y. And so we have X big R, big R, X big R, little r, X big R, Y. 
X little r y. So what do we have here? We have quite a few different um, phenotypes. We are going to see this individual is a female and she is healthy. We will see this individual who's also a female and she has Rett syndrome. Now, why does she have Rett syndrome? Because remember, this is X-linked dominant, so we only need to inherit one mutated allele. And in fact, that's what happened here. There's one mutated allele. Now we're going to look at this bottom row. We're going to see a male and he is healthy. We see that big letter. And then we have another male here and we see this small r. So we're going to say he has Rett syndrome. So we have healthy female, unhealthy female, healthy male, unhealthy male. And as we then move down this chart, we can see how the affected male will develop through this scenario right here. And we see the female and how an affected female is going to develop here, right there. And we might see then, of course, healthy male, healthy female, and they've developed in this manner. We see our healthy female and our healthy male develop. And so this gives you an idea of the inheritance pattern by which we are looking at X-linked dominant disorders. Please be sure as you're working on these problems, you are going to need to use superscripts and make sure you're also letting a letter equal something and write that out in your problems in your work. That'll help keep track of things as you're moving forward. Let's go ahead now. Let's look at this pairing here. So I'm going to erase this information. We know we have a healthy female, X, R, X, R, and we have an affected male. And so we know that needs to be X little r, Y. So let's go ahead and take it X big R, X big R times X little r, Y. We'll make our pennant square. And so we'll go X big R, big R, X, little r, y. So let's see how this works. I'm going to see x and then x big r, x little r, x r, y, x r, y. So what do we have here? We're going to see two females. Both of those females are going to be impacted by Rett syndrome because they only need one affected allele and that's what they both have. They've they've inherited it this way. Now when we look at our, so I'll say this is times two, and then when we look at our male, we're going to see males are also going to be the same. We will have two healthy males. And what do we see when we look at that? We're going to see our impacted females from here and here. And we will see our normal males here and here. I hope this helps you in terms of looking at the inheritance pattern using these pennant squares as well as using our superscripts. If you have questions, reach out to me. Let's keep moving forward with lecture. In Y-linked inheritance, a given trait is carried on the Y chromosome and it's transmitted from father to son only. If a male has a trait, so should his father and his paternal grandfather as well as his sons and their sons. Y-link traits never occur in females because females do not have a Y chromosome. The concept of dominant and recessive don't apply to Y-link traits, as only one allele on the Y chromosome is ever present in any one individual. A term geneticists use for this is called the hemizygote, where only one allele is present. Examples of Y-link disorders are retinitis pigmentosa, linked to a gene called RPY, by which a group of rare eye disorders affect the retina, the light-sensitive layer of the tissue in the back of the eye. Retinosa pigmentosa makes cells in the retina break down slowly over time, lending to a loss of central vision needed to read, to drive, to recognize people. 
Another disorder by which the Y chromosome has been linked is that of hypertrichosis pinea oris, or excessive ear hair, though some studies show there might be another mode of inheritance beyond what we see with the Y chromosome. In contrast to X-linked inheritance, patterns of gene expression may be affected by the gender of an individual, even when the genes aren't on the X chromosome. In some cases, the expression of a specific phenotype is absolutely limited to one gender. In others, the gender of an individual influences the expression of phenotype, but the phenotype is expressed in both genders. This distinction differentiates sex-limited inheritance from sex-influenced inheritance. So this slide will be talking about sex-limited inheritance. Our next slide is going to cover sex-influenced. In both types of inheritance, autosomal genes are responsible for some kind of a phenotype, but the expression of these genes is dependent on a hormone constitution within the individual. As it pertains to sex-limited inheritance, our textbook provides some examples such as beard growth in humans, the gene that causes beards to grow is located on an autosome, but it's only expressed in males and not females. A woman has the genes but doesn't produce the hormones needed to promote gene expression for typical beard growth. Further, only males can have prostate cancer because women don't have a prostate gland and only females can have ovarian cancer as men don't have ovaries. Although both men and women carry the genes and thus can develop mutations in the genes associated with both of those conditions with prostate cancer and ovarian cancer. So that's sex limited. In contrast, we have sex influenced inheritance. These are autosomal traits influenced by the sex of an individual and have a different intensity of expression in sexes. For example, in a gene that leads to male pattern baldness, the trait is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait in men, meaning men only need one mutant allele to express the phenotype for baldness. However, in females, this trait is inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. Females need two mutant alleles to express the baldness phenotype. Thus, it's less likely, though certainly not impossible, for females to express the trait. The term X inactivation, when we look at the XXXY sex determination mode, we should see there's a problem with the dosage of genes on the X and Y chromosome, specifically because females have two copies of the X chromosome, whereas males only have one X chromosome. So how is this a problem? Well, if we imagine genes on the X chromosome coding for proteins, if we have two X chromosomes as females, we could potentially produce twice the protein or some kind of a gene product for a given gene as compared to males who only have one copy of the X chromosome. How has the human body and some other organisms overcome the extra dosage? Over time, a process has evolved by which the unequal dosage in the sexes is corrected by reducing the activity of genes on one of the X chromosomes in females. Specifically, in the early stages of embryo development, in the presence of just a few cells, one of our X chromosomes in each cell is inactivated. And in most mammals, except marsupial mammals, such as the kangaroo, the koala, I guess the, the wombat, I believe, X chromosomes, that X chromosome inactivation is chosen at random. What's important to take into account then is that those cell lines, those very, very early embryo cell lines continue to undergo mitosis and undergo differentiation and the X chromosome inactivated in a particular somatic cell will remain inactive in all the descendants of that cell. So how does X inactivation work? Our textbook introduces you to a gene on the X chromosome called XIST, X-I-S-T. X-I-S-T is a gene at the site on the X chromosome called the X inactivation center. And this gene encodes for an RNA segment that binds to a specific site on the same inactivated X chromosome, ultimately silencing that X chromosome. It does this by spreading itself outward, and we, we kind of see that through here where we've created uh, this RNA component, and now we're spreading that outward from the X inactivation center, coding the X chromosome, and then a variety of other molecular activities unfold, including adding some methyl groups, which are CH3 groups, along the nucleotides of a chromosome, leading to complete inactivation. The textbook introduces a new term in this section as well, specifically the idea that X inactivation is an example of epigenetic change. That is, it's a change passed from one cell to the next, but the change doesn't 
alter the DNA base sequence of the genes on that given chromosome. In some cell types, the inactive X chromosome can be observed microscopically as a dense staining structure in the nucleus, and we see that right here. That's called a bar body. So this is the idea of X inactivation, and we have that X inactivation center by which we have a gene that codes for an RNA molecule that's going to end up spreading itself out, leading to that X inactivation. Lastly, we have the idea of genomic imprinting. This is going to finish chapter six. We're going to talk about this concept of genomic imprinting. And up through now, we've learned that everyone is exactly half their mother and half their father, right? We were, we've talked about that. And we've made the assumption that an allele will behave in a similar manner in offspring, no matter having inherited it from the mother or inherited it from the father. But that's not always the case. Several different biological processes can change that balance. And one such process is the concept called genomic imprinting, which is another form of epigenetic change. What does this mean? Well, remember from our last slide that epigenetic changes are changes passed from one cell to the next without altering or changing the genetic makeup of an organism. That is, without changing the DNA-based sequences of genes on a given chromosome. Rather, in this case, the change occurs by modifying activation genes. In genomic imprinting, genes are turned off or left on depending on whether the gene in question was inherited from the mother or from the father. Recall these genes are said to be homologous. Well, let's skip the discussion of sex chromosomes for now and just focus on autosomes, okay? In a typical scenario, both copies contribute to some gene product or expressed physical trait. However, there are special circumstances by which either the mother's or the father's gene copy is inactivated or turned off. We might say it's silenced, leaving just one copy of a gene on, and we call those genes imprinted genes. The process of inactivation occurs as a result of attaching methyl groups to nucleotides, our cytosine nucleotides. So we're going to see a methyl, so here's our cytosine, and we're going to see a methyl group attached in this spot right here. Recall, we have thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine nucleotides, but this is cytosine we're looking at. And so a strand of DNA, we have various cytosines with the help of an enzyme called DNA methyltransferase. We're going to put these methyl groups on cytosine. Also, I want to point out here, this occurs primarily in autosomes. We've already looked at how this might happen on sex chromosomes, specifically X inactivation on the X chromosome. So we're looking at autosomes here. Gene imprinting occurs during gamete formation and involves a process called this DNA methylation. And so what we want to do now, I want to point out genomic imprinting can be passed from cell to cell in the process of mitosis, but imprinted genes are not passed from individual to individual. So from parent to offspring during meiosis. Rather, in meiosis, the imprinted gene that was turned off with these methyl groups is turned back on. Thus, that methyl group is temporarily removed. And with this, this is going to conclude this chapter's materials. I will be sending out, of course, some study guides with practice problems to help you with these sex-linked inheritance patterns. If you have questions, reach out. Meanwhile, make it a great day.